Thank you very much and good to see everybody. I think one of the things that uh, Sanjay and I want to put us to put a caveat on, no, we're not immunologists or virologists. And um, also we have to be aware that this is a you know, relatively new disease and there are things that are not known, let alone that we don't know. So, you know, we will try and give you as much information as we can tonight, answer as many questions as we can, but just to make the proviso, we may not have all the answers. And that's uh, our job to keep trying to find out answers as we go along. So hopefully everybody can see my slides. And what we'll do is that if I give my brief presentation and Sanjay give his presentation, and then we can take general questions at the end um, and, and hopefully have some discussion, okay? So um, the first thing to say is, um, you know, we, we've now been in this, I don't know whether you want to call it mess situation for um, nine months. Yes, we seem to be coming out of it, we thought, but as predicted, we've gone back into a second wave. Um, in, the whole point is that, um, yes, we've hit winter, so we've got the second wave and the fact that it's felt that the virus was more transmissible. We then have the, the new variant, which is more transmissible than previously. Um, and uh, the other thing about that and why there's such an overwhelming um, impact on hospitals, particularly amongst adults, I'll, I'll make that point, is the fact that um, we've got this on top of our usual um, winter surge of different illnesses. So it's like what they keep referring to in the, in the media as a pre perfect storm, and which is why um, we've all gone back into lockdown. Now, when we've been thinking about, of course, COVID, so one of the key questions is who is more at risk to COVID-19 and who is more at risk of severe disease? And when we originally went into this in March, there was a whole shielding programme because of the, all those that were thought to be particularly vulnerable. Well, as time has gone on, it has not been thought that children are vulnerable to the more severe disease. They may be carriers, they may have mild illness, but they do not get it as severe as adults in the majority. And indeed, there's been a rethink about those who would be classed children I'm talking about as clinically extremely vulnerable. And most of those would be classed as those who had a deficiency or a suppression of their immune system. Um, and that may be from a natural disease or maybe such as in cancer where they've got very specific um, target of, of suppressing their immune system as part of their cancer therapy. There are a whole list of other range of diseases that have been listed as particularly vulnerable, but um, in neurology, these have been mainly individuals who've got respiratory or swallowing um, problems um, or who are at risk of what we call discompensation, that meaning getting a profound neurological deterioration as a result uh, um, in, in the event of an infection. This does not necessarily relate to um, seizures in relation to infection or illness, which I'll come to. So these are the kinds of illnesses that would be listed as clinically extremely vulnerable. And that you will see that epilepsy or any particular epilepsy syndrome is not listed. That said, there may be particular um, epilepsies where there may be um, certain um, thing, uh, different things in association, such as problems with um, swallowing and, and proneness to chest infections, that after an individual discussion with physicians, um, it may be that the child would be classed as a clinically extremely vulnerable and therefore thought to need to protect uh, against the infection. The one thing I'll add, however, is that we haven't got any evidence that there have been increased admissions or increased risk of status epilepticus or prolonged seizures um, in children, not only with Dravé syndrome, but with epilepsy per se. This acknowledged, considering that you may expect more in the way of prolonged seizures or um, uh, seizures in relation to illness or um, fever, but it doesn't appear to be any more than you would see with any particular febrile illness. So what about vaccinations? Well, um, you know, yes, there's a lot of talk about vaccinations and it's the way we're going to see ourselves out of the current situation. But I also acknowledge there's a lot of worry about how fast vaccinations have been developed and what, what indeed is the safety. A vaccine is a product can be used to um, to safely um, 
infer an immune response in an individual that will protect against a particular infection. And therefore the vaccine will contain proteins that are either derived from the, abnorm the abnormal virus or bacteria or produced in an artificial way to represent that. Oh my God, I don't know what's going on my computer here. Um, so, you know, if we think about many vaccinations over the years, they have what have led us out to many previous pandemics. If not from, um, you know, we routinely now think about diphtheria, tetanus and um, uh, uh, pertussis and indeed polio vaccines, but they've only actually come online over the past um, 50 years. And what each of these graphs show, which I took from um, a wonderful review article, is that with the introduction of the vaccine, the plummet in the condition that is actually seen. And I think the most um, you know, dramatic was actually the polio that's seen here, but also the other um, measles, whooping cough, this little blip of whooping cough when there was actually um, concern about the vaccine and the uptake of the vaccine was not actually very good. And there are many different ways, and these are lovely pictures, but just to illustrate a way of using um, product to actually stimulate, be, be used as a vaccine, whether it be what they call a live attenuated, so actually it's a weakened viral product or a virus that may be injected to initiate um, uh, the immune response. The, the product that the, um, the bacteria produces called the toxoid, um, different parts of the actual virus that have been inactivated. And what's mo most recently been done have been what's called viral vectored, which means that it's um, changed virus that's actually been utilized from modeled on a different virus, or indeed the, the um, genetic material from the virus that's been formulated and actually then subsequently injected. And this is the basis of what the new vaccines are. And because there's been a lot of work done previously, the reason why they've been able to develop so quickly was that they got the genetic code of the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID very quickly, and they were able to utilize existing technology in order to develop the virus. And the one thing to say with testing all of the viruses is that they've been through all the rigorous um, uh, testing, trials and assessment that any other would be, even if we weren't looking for a rapid turnaround. What the virus then does is it gets in, once it's injected, it will trigger an immune response, which is then lasting. And yes, it may require two, vac two doses in order to get the maximal um, response. And indeed, what would be referred to as the memory, the vaccine memory, in order to actually then sustain a long res um, uh, response. But of course, there's been a lot of talk over many years, particularly in children, about vaccinations and seizures and with any vaccination there's always been concern about can it trigger seizures or can it in, in, in fact trigger a more of a neurological illness. Now the first thing to say is as I've already alluded to vaccinations may cause fever because actually you're triggering a response if not will be a more mild response and this in part the immune response involves fever and of course then febrile seizures could occur. But there was a lot of talk, particularly in the 1980s, about the possibility of what's called a vaccine-induced encephalopathy, which is actually particular a neurological response in relation to the vaccine. And this was particular concern around the whooping cough vaccine. But what's subsequently been found is that, you know, we used to give the vaccinations for diphtheria, tetanus, polio, and pertussis at two, four, and six months. But in your lifetime, it was changed and it's now given at two, three and four months. And what had been happening is that particular um, individuals were presenting with seizures initially after the first vaccine, actually, sorry, which was at three, six and nine months at three, three months. And then subsequently after the second vaccine, when it was later changed. And it appears, and particularly with further research, that actually many of the children who were vaccinated in that first year and presented with seizures following the vaccine were likely to have been children with Dravet syndrome having um, seizures in relation to fever. 
And what it was also shown was that these children were probably going to present anyway, it may have been brought forward slightly with, you to, with the vaccination. So the vaccination itself did not cause the neurological problem. It was a genetic predisposition, which was then caused, by, um, a seizure was caused by the fever as a result of the vaccination. And there are risk, and it's also been looked at with regard to um, other studies, such as this was another big Danish study where they looked at all children born between 2003 and 2008 and looked at the risk of febrile seizures after a DPT vaccine. And basically, there was a higher risk on day one. So that's when the fever occurs and the, the risk sl slowly went down by time but there was no risk, increased risk of epilepsy in the long term. It's also been looked at with other vaccines. This is with the MMR vaccine. Um, and this is where, of course, you get two doses. And actually the first dose, um, when they're small, then there is a slight risk of fever, but this occurs at up to 10 days following the vaccine, not immediately. Um, whereas when they have the second booster or they use had may have had a, a second booster, then there was no increased risk of febrile seizures or indeed fever. And there's also been looked at with regard to influenza, and it depends on the type of influenza vaccine you've received. And again, it's a risk of fever that may lead to the convulsion, not actually inducing seizures or epilepsy that wouldn't have occurred in any case. So as you'll be aware, there are now three vaccines approved. But what we also have to be aware of is actually that two are um, licensed for use more old, over the age of 18 and then the Pfizer vaccine for licensed for use over the age of 16. So currently there is no plan to vaccinate children or individuals under the age of 16. Um, uh, because there's no safety data and this is the general policy and also the belief that children are not susceptible to severe illness or you know that they actually have a much milder form of the illness and actually the the vaccination committee the plan is to offer vaccination um, in a tiered fashion so of course the the very um, uh, elderly are actually in group one and in fact those that are actually thought to be at risk groups, which are individuals over the age of 16 with all these conditions, including chronic neurological disease, including epilepsy, will be vaccinated at the same time as those over age 65, which I think is actually number four in the rollout. So it, they are, you know, individuals over the age of 16 with these conditions are being considered for vaccination but actually it will not be in the first tranche, it's in the level four tranche of the rollout of the vaccine. So after that sort of whistle-stop tour through vaccination, um, I'll hand over to Sanjay, who's going to talk a bit more about adults um, and susceptibility. Sanjay. So as Helen said, neither of us are experts in immunology or in infectious disease and what I'm going to be saying is either drawn from the published literature or from the limited personal experience um, that, that I've had with uh, adults with Dravé syndrome. So I guess um, the rates of infection as we all know with this new virus depend on many things. Some of those things relate to the virus itself and we all know that there seems to be a more contagious form of the virus that's currently going around aggravating this second wave. And, and I think the most important thing still remains the main message from Public Health England and from the government, which is to do what you can to minimize the risk of infection and spreading the infection. That comes down again to hands, face and space. And that really is critical. There's not many more steps left, I think the government has reasonably. And so it's up to all of us, I think, to, to adhere to this hands, face and space. So there isn't much information about infection risk in Dravet syndrome, um, but there was a survey, which, as I say, um, was done through Dravet syndrome UK over about a month in the middle of 2020. And of course, we know that things have changed since then. So we might want to try and gather more information because this is still going to be useful um, for the future. So these are some of the outcomes um, from um, this survey, given that there is really very little information about COVID and its risks in, in adults with Dravet syndrome. 
So in this survey, there were 116 responses collected, which I think is just brilliant, really. Um, the majority, as you see here, three quarters were from uh, families of children who have Dravet syndrome, and about a quarter from families of adults with Dravet syndrome. And at that stage, because um, obviously information was even more limited than it is now, most of the people with Dravet syndrome uh, from whom responses were available were shielded at home during the family, uh, sorry, during the lockdown at the family home. Now, of these um, 116 odd uh, people, um, about a fifth, one in 20, had symptoms that were compatible with COVID-19. But it has to be said that most of these people were not tested um, to see if they actually had um, infection with the virus, and only a few were. And of those, none, in fact, turned out to, to be carrying the virus. So all we can say is that the, is that the people here who we thought had it, um, we thought had it on the basis of the, of the symptoms they had, not because they were proven to have had it. In fact, there was only one person who was shown to be um, uh, positive and symptomatic. One person had repeatedly positive tests while in hospital for a separate illness, but did not have typical symptoms of COVID-19. One thing that did emerge was that seizures were either more frequent or more prolonged or sometimes both in about half of the people who developed possible or probable symptoms of COVID-19. But I think it's worth again keeping in mind that it might not have been um, COVID-19, it could have been some other illness associated with fever uh, and immunological activation. And we know obviously from all, all your own experience and from our experience as clinicians that things that cause fever or inflammation, whatever intercurrent that illness is, a urine infection or a chest infection, can make seizures worse for people who have Dravet syndrome. And we know that, and we know the risks of seizures obviously in Dravet syndrome. So it's something that we, I think we have to keep in mind, and, and many of you will already be doing things like ensuring that temperatures are kept um, controlled where possible, um, with antipyretics, with external cooling measures. That's an important thing in general, as you will all know, for people with Dravet syndrome. Some other outcomes from this survey um, was that there, uh, that there were people who had other aspects of Dravet syndrome that might increase their risk of developing COVID-19 or severe features of COVID-19. So for example, about a quarter of the people uh, from whom responses were available, about whom responses were available, had a tendency to respiratory problems, a history of recurrent infections. And of course that can sometimes be associated with swallowing difficulties, um, which might be itself associated with um, having to have a gastrostomy in place. And anything that can compromise the normal function of breathing and the normal ability to clear the chest, like a, a scoliosis or a curved or twisted spine, can also risk, increase the risk of chest infections and potentially therefore um, uh, worse outcomes with COVID-19. But there didn't seem to be any association between any of these comorbidities and the presentation of the COVID-19 symptoms. So although these are general principles, it wasn't clear um, that this was particularly associated with what we thought might be COVID-19. On the other hand, there were some aspects to the shielding, and, and some of you will have provided these responses yourself. And so there was, for example, quite a lot of parental anxiety that came out as a result of this, uh, not as a result, but collected in this survey, for which there were many factors. And, and some of these included, for example, the risks of carers coming into the home, or other family members contracting the infection, so the anxiety around that and then passing it on to the person with Dravet syndrome. Anxieties related to hospital attendance, so not wanting to go to hospital or to hospital appointments, totally understandable, I think. And of course, the lack of shielding, uh, sorry, lack of support during shielding. And in some cases, problems with um, disruption of the normal routine. I think many of us have found that difficult um, and particularly difficult perhaps when you're not able to explain or understand um, why that should be. Um, and some of the other concerns that have been noted in general, this is not just for people with Dravet syndrome, but in general, um, for families of people um, with severe epilepsies through the pandemic, this is from a, a different paper, this is from a Spanish study. Uh, concerns that were expressed included, for example, um, the fact that therapy was being monitored less closely, uh, um, drug levels, for example, might be monitored less closely. There were concerns about reduced contact with medical teams and the fact that often 
um, some people had cognitive difficulties are more likely to have behavioral problems and externalize those behavioral problems during this really unusual um, period of time. And that may be the experience that some of you have already had. So although shielding, I think, was uh, an understandable thing to do during the first wave, it's clear that it wasn't without its problems. And if we look at <clears throat> the risks of COVID itself, so obviously these data are continuing to be produced and are continuing to get more and more precise. It's clear that COVID does carry risks. So there's something like nine or 10 times the risk of dying if somebody has um, a, a virologically or clinically diagnosed um, COVID-19. So it does carry increased risks. It does carry risks even of mortality. And in this particular study, which was a nationwide study, but now obviously a little bit older, in those people who are shown to have the virus, definitely have the virus, the mortality in that group in, in this particular study, this is not overall, but in this particular study was, was 18%. And the factors that were associated with a higher risk of mortality included um, having long-term conditions such as learning disability. So this is not, you shouldn't take this figure as, as, the, as the outcome for everybody, but this is in a particular group of people. And the point, I think the take home point is the numbers aren't so important, is that COVID does carry risks. And we're hearing that all the time um, in the news. In this study of people with intellectual disability, so these authors looked at 66 people who had intellectual disability and who had succumbed to COVID-19. And they found that this group of people were younger in, overall um, at the time of death than um, the general population of people who died of COVID-19. And that um, the, the, the features that were seen in this group included having profound intellectual disability, epilepsy, dysphagia, some of the features that we see in people who have Dravet syndrome. So I think the take home message from this is that at least in adults, I'm not talking about children here, I'm talking about adults, COVID-19 does carry risks. And if there are additional features present, then some of those risks of severe outcomes from COVID-19 might be increased. I'm oh, sorry. And so um, I think this is an important um, uh, set of data which has been collected at our center by Karen Kipper, um, and it's from the Office for National Statistics. And what this shows is deaths that have been registered um, attributed to epilepsy or status epilepticus week by week over a period of time. So if you look at the red line, that's the average for the five years up to 2020. And you can see that it fluctuates a little bit, but it's around about, you can see here, around about maybe 16 to 18, more or less, per week, okay, on average over the last five years. If you then look at what happened during COVID, during the pandemic, so this is, this is the period of the maximum lockdown that we had last year. And you can see that the number of, of deaths which were attributed to epilepsy or status epilepticus rose. And careful analysis here is a little bit difficult, but it suggests it's not actually due to COVID itself. It's because of the consequences of COVID, of the reduced medical contact, the um, um, reduced monitoring. And in fact, what Karen also showed was that the number of requests for therapeutic drug monitoring over this time fell, but the number of requests for post-mortem uh, monitoring, samples from people who had succumbed um, as a result of epilepsy or status epilepticus, rose. So I think the message from all of this is that in adults at least, COVID is something to be taken seriously. And I think this really then tells us something about the risk of vaccination, because when we're talking about the risk of vaccination, we've got to balance that against the risk of not vaccinating people with Dravet syndrome who might be adults. So in general, as I think Helen um, um, alluded to this, the risk of vaccination, sorry, the risk of seizures associated with vaccination depends on the vaccine that's being used. So, and these are various studies which look at the rates of seizures occurring in a certain period of time after particular vaccines are given. And you can see that it depends on the vaccine. So for a particular type of pertussis vaccine, um, the rate is relatively low, but for a different type of pertussis vaccine, the rate is higher. And, and the same you can see here for MMR vaccination, it depends on the vaccine that's being given. We don't know yet for the, um, the COVID-19 vaccine, SARS-2, uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that are available, the three of them that Helen mentioned, we don't know what the risks 
of seizures associated with those vaccines are. We can't extrapolate from this, but what we do know is the um, serious risk of, uh, of really serious outcomes from infection in, in adults, especially when there are other features um, that adults um, with Dravet syndrome may have. And then this slide, I, I left this slide just like this because this is data that's really um, hot off the press. Um, and this has come from the fact that over the, um, actually it wasn't over, it was over Friday, just, so just four days ago, the almost the entire residential population at Chalfont, which is about 100 people, um, were vaccinated. It was a huge effort, a huge logistic effort, and the team did really amazing work to achieve this. Um, and this uh, hopefully will give us some information about the risks of seizures in adults, not just with Dravé syndrome, but with a variety of severe epilepsies following vaccination. I think one difficulty is that pretty much at the same time as um, these vaccinations have been given, there have been more cases of infection with the virus um, in the residential population, which is going to make it a little bit difficult to tease out um, the cause um, of fevers or, or seizures or increased seizures. And I think just the last thing to end with is just to let you know that we do have three adults with Dravet syndrome um, who are residents at Chalfont um, and obviously whose um, um, uh, medical history and care we know quite a lot about. And over this period of time, so, um, so some information really is very um, new and, and some that's been gathered over this period of time. One of those individuals has tested positive twice for the virus at two separate intervals, several months apart, with several negative tests in between. So it really looks as though this person has been infected twice. It's not clear whether that's with um, the old variant and the new variant, um, although we're looking into that. And on both occasions, the person's been completely fine, no symptoms whatsoever. Another person with Dravet syndrome was infected um, quite early on during the first wave and had some symptoms, which eventually um, meant that uh, the person had to go to hospital, um, but actually very quickly recovered from um, the symptoms of COVID-19, but then ended up staying in hospital for quite some time because they continued to uh, test positive for the virus. And at that stage, we didn't really know um, how to manage that. Um, but actually, that person's been well since, and they were well throughout that long period of time where they continue to test um, positively for the virus. And then the third person has recently tested positive and has no symptoms whatsoever. So we're talking about three adults um, um, with uh, Dravet syndrome. And so it's a really small number, um, a really small number to draw any conclusions from. Um, I just relate to the histories that we, we have. So I think that's all I had to say. Um, so uh, Helen, back to you, Helen Evans. Back to you. Thank you very much to you both. Um, that was um, incredibly informative and um, you know, really appreciate the time you've taken to go through that. Um, so I'd, I'd suggest we now move on with uh, questions that haven't been covered uh, within your presentations. Um, so, Professor Cross, um, would you like to begin first by looking through some of those questions that we've shared with you? There were three on the actual vaccines themselves, which I hope that we have, well, I've tried to answer as much as I can. Um, and apart from the fact about minimising the risk um, of fever following a vaccination is actually, you know, watching for the first 24, 48 hours and giving regular antipyretics during that period. Um, there's a question about whether a COVID vaccine is safe. You're on steropental, clobazam, and um, I would imagine another medication. I have to say that we haven't got any evidence that any vaccine um, is contraindicated if you're on certain medications. You know, you have to think about the underlying condition rather than medications. And I don't think we've got any evidence that the medication um, is going to influence how you react to a medication. Um, but to give a definitive response of that, of course, we, we, we can't do. Um, you know, when the, the, I don't know whether you want, there's a lot of questions again about the act on the vaccine and I'm not sure, I mean, I thought we'd covered most of that. Um, you know, there is an issue about 
is there any more safety with one vaccine against another or any more risk with one vaccine against another? And I think that's very difficult to know. The main advantage of the AstraZeneca vac Oxford vaccine is that it doesn't have to be kept in such, such cold facilities and therefore can be transported more easily to vaccination sites. Um, I don't think we've got any more or less evidence that fever is going to be caused by one over and above another um, or that the safety is any different. Nobody knows this. They've all been evaluated and they've all been licensed. Um, uh, it's just that one has been licensed for over 16 and the others over 18, although. Um, and so those between 16 and 18 will, of course, be offered the uh, those that require a vaccine will be offered, I'm sure, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, there are some questions about um, priority groupings for the vaccines. Um, Sanjay, I don't know whether you want to say anything about the priority groupings for, you know, where adults with Dravet syndrome sit within that. As I said, we already said we don't make the policies. Um, and what I put on the slide was what the existing thought is so that it, they will be vaccinated in the same batch as those over the age of 65. I don't know whether, um, uh, Sanjay, you want to say anything else about that? Uh, no, I, I don't think I can add anything really because we don't have any data. Um, so I think we have to, we have to go by um, those recommendations currently. And there was sort of some concern, how can we get faster priority? I don't think anybody is able to do that. Um, and, you know, it, I mean, I think we, we, as I said, we don't draw up the policies and there has to be some degree of um, uh, policy in order to make sure that there's clarity for those across the board. So, um, you know, th there isn't any evidence that, you know, that those that are in the clinically vulnerable group should be done any sooner than those over 60, um, under 60, uh, over 65. So, you know, I think we'll be quite quick in getting to that point. It's just frustrating when we know that people have been vaccinated and others are, are still in the list. Um, Okay, so then we come on to vulnerable status and um, shielding. And there's a question here, um, uh, Sanjay, and I don't know whether you want to answer this. In, in our shared professional expertise, should adults with Dravet syndrome be as presumed within group six learning disability, or should they be classified as clinically extremely vulnerable now that we know how appalling the outcomes are for learning disabled adults alone? Do you want to emphasize, I mean, I know you covered this in part in your talk. Do you want to explore that a bit more? Well, I think it's it's very difficult, isn't it, to, uh, to have guidelines um, that are super specific. You can imagine, you know, Helen and I know a little bit about epilepsy and, and, and the various syndromes that there are and the complications that they can carry. You think about the whole range of medical conditions, it's enormous. So I think it's very difficult for, uh, I have some sympathy here with, with people are drawing up these guidelines because they can't really include, you know, all the different conditions across the spectrum of medical illnesses, not just in epilepsy. Um, and I guess we just have to gather this information and there is some information that's coming out about um, the risks of infection with, uh, with COVID um, for people who do have comorbidities. Um, and that's why I think it's important that the vaccination is given because I know there's this, there's this obviously there's, there's always a tension between should the vaccine be given or not given um, the risks associated with vaccine induced fevers as, as Helen was discussing. I think the information that we have to date suggests that vaccination is worthwhile um, because we know what happens with fevers. I guess most of you will have had your children will have had fevers and you've managed those, um, but with COVID. We, we don't have the same treatments available. Uh, and sometimes there aren't things that we can do to treat the consequences. Of infection. So I think uh, I, all I feel comfortable saying at the moment is that in my opinion, with the evidence that's available, um, vaccination is an important step to take. And I think it's important to realize that actually the vaccination isn't only necessarily just for the individual, but by getting the majority of people vaccinated eventually, 
this also um, falls within the herd immunity so that the actual active infection gets less within the community and the population. So, you know, there is a concern about who isn't being vaccinated, but actually vaccinating the most vulnerable to the disease ultimately with increasing numbers also reduces the active infection in the community. Um, there's a very individual question which I can see can see, appear not to make sense in the sense that um, an individual has been told that their son needs to shield but then the whole family needs to shield um, and what's difficult to comment on is whether there's very specific reasons for that shielding. Um, Drave syndrome per se, I wouldn't class that would need to be shielded, particularly at the age of nine, but you know, there may be other reasons. And I can see then you think, well, why isn't he on the list for vaccination if he's being told to shield? But then again, as I said previously, part of the role of vaccination is to move towards reducing the community infection and herd immunity. So I think there does need to be a question with now that we know more whether shielding is absolutely necessary. But actually, as time goes on, as more individuals get vaccinated, then the amount of infection in the community should reduce. Um, there is a question again about the issue of epilepsy being treated as a blanket condition, and I acknowledge that. There is the issue about fever triggering longer seizures. I think, you know, in the children, it's not something that we've seen in regular hospital admission. I know there is the issue about the fact that um, concern about going to hospital if they have long seizures or concern if there's an increase in seizures about going to hospital in the middle of a a pandemic and that may have mitigated some of the figures but certainly in children um, when hospital admissions have been looked at and even ITU requirement epilepsy does not appear to have been in that. It appears that children are less susceptible to, uh, to severe disease but I acknowledge in adults that may be an ongoing concern. Do you want to say anything else to, back to that Sanjay? No, I agree. I think I think in this uh, situation, um, the the picture for children and adults does seem to be different. Yeah, I don't think that's Dravé syndrome related. That's just generally for children and adults. Helen, I don't know if there are any other questions, but I think that we've covered them. And it may be that some people feel we haven't clarified things that I think we've clarified in the presentations. So I'm perfectly happy to take additional questions. Oh, thank you so much to you both. Um, and and um, I know we received a large number of questions. I think you've you know covered uh, a lot in a short period of time. Um, I mean, we, if it's OK with you, we do have a few more minutes before we yeah. hit nine. And if you look to the chat functionality, I know we've had um, one question come in and just a, a comment about um, the, uh, the vaccination plan in phase six. Um, so if I could ask everybody, if you have any more questions, um, we may not be able to cover all of them, but if you could add them into the chat functionality now. And so the question that was posed is, do we know of any plans to get the vaccine approved for children? Um, and then uh, it says the vaccination plan published on the 30th of December says phase six, after all 65s are done, will include those who are in receipt of a carer's allowance or those who are the main care of an elderly or disabled person whose welfare may be at risk if the carer falls ill. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't put that on the thing, but that's quite clear. Yeah. And then we've just had a, two more come in, so I'll just take the first one. If your child has COVID back in April, will they still need a vaccine? Well, number one, I have to say that the current policy is that children are not going to be vaccinated. And someone says, someone has asked when they're going to be approved. I mean, at the moment, the vaccines have not been tested in children. The trials have been 18 or 16 and over. They have not involved children. So I am not aware at the present time, and particularly with the policy that children appear to have a lesser illness, that there is a plan for them to be, to be um, uh, tried and, and accept, uh, um, licensed in children. The things are changing all the time and I may not be up to date on, as I said, I have to say, I'm not an immunologist or a virologist. 
and therefore I may, but that is not what, you know, that's the current policy. So, you know, if the child has had COVID back in April, they're still not going to get a vaccine. What I think is an extension of this question is if you've had COVID, are you immune? And I think the current presumption is we don't know. Um, there are reports of individuals having it twice. Sanjay mentioned a patient that's actually been tested on two separate occasions, tested positive and negative, I assume, in between. So we, we don't know whether you get lasting immunity from having had the infection, why, which is why you're not being asked whether you've had it and not vaccinated. Everybody is being vaccinated who is entitled to the vaccination. So this is an unknown, essentially. But again, there is no plan to vaccinate children under the age of 16 at the present time. And the priority for carers of vulnerable children, again, yes, I mean, I think they come into this whole issue about carers going to be considered. And if that decision is made by your local team, then you're obviously going to be included in the vaccination programme. So I think we'll, uh, we'll bring the webinar to a close. I'm just gonna hand back to our chair, Galia Wilson, just to uh, conclude. Um, thank you very much, um, Helen and Sanjay. I think everybody has hopefully found that really helpful. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much yet again from all of us and um, good night, everybody. Thank you.